the month of December is arrival month. Not just because it's going to be Christmas, but because it reminds us we're going to get to personally meet Jesus soon. And because that's a little bit intimidating, then we get him to talk to us. We invite him to come each week to our time together and have a little talk with us. And in the Bible readings for this week, he gives a little talk to us, uh, to each of us. And that helps us to be ready for when he returns or arrives again. When he has a little talk with us, he talks to us about what happened the first time he came. While some people might say, well, that wasn't so good what happened on the first. Yes, I know about that. But it is good for us because of what terrible stuff happened to him and because he had to devote his whole life to keeping his head right and giving us his own holiness. So that's what we celebrate the month before Christmas to help us get our heads straight. Something else weird about today and our time together today is that we're not going to start with the section from the Gospels. We're going to start with the Old Testament section because we want to focus on the Bible section from the Gospel of Mark for this week. If you are ready to go, I think it's time. And so what I want you to do, it's going to help you immensely if you can follow along with the Bible readings once we get started on them. It's really going to help you. It's going to help you double than if you listen to me read them to you. I have the sheet that tells the Bible readings, and I will read them off that sheet. I printed it off the computer. So I got the sheet. But if you follow along, it's going to help you concentrate and better get the message. So if you can follow along on the Bible readings on the website, that's one option for you. If you would prefer to use your personal Bible, that's nice too, because that's even nicer probably, because you can write stuff in that sticks out in your mind, and that section will always be memorable to you because of what you noted down. That's going to be good. If you want to use your tablet or phone to follow the Bible rings in a translation you prefer. Really good too. Excellent as well. You can probably make notes in, in your, uh, you know, electronically that will stick to that section. We don't always know how to do that, but any kind of notes we can take is going to help us better capture and retain the stuff we hear when we get together like this for three Bible sections and some talk about them. Without further ado, we're going to the Old Testament section, the only Bible that Jesus had. Oh, I cannot turn the page here. Something's wrong. Let me see if I can rectify it. There we go. All right, so you can see that we're going to be in the Isaiah book. That is going to be a little bit past the middle of your hard copy Bible. And the Isaiah book itself is a pretty formidable piece of uh, literature. It's 66 chapters long. But beginning in chapter 40, you got a bunch of nuggets that have been immortal, immortalized they're really good. And Isaiah 40 is one of them. The Bible sections that we focus on during, from, from the Gospels, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this year we're focusing on Mark. And so we'll get an introduction during December to John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer used sections like Isaiah 40 to get through to the people who came to him in the middle of nowhere and we're willing to camp out in less than five-star accommodations, sleeping on the ground in the desert, having bugs crawl all over you, eating next to nothing, just like John the Baptizer did. But they wanted to hear 
the news from Isaiah like we have here. See if you can't pick out the parts that have to do with Jesus. Remember, the whole Old Testament Bible, Jesus explained to us, is about him. So take a look at what Isaiah 40 verses 1 to 11 say. Comfort my people. Comfort them, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem's people and give them the announcement that their hard times are over. And a stranger has paid for all their wrongs. We don't have to pay for them ourselves. Nope, a stranger is going to pay for all your wrongs. Yahweh has given them twice as many blessings as the penalty they deserve. Whoa, this is good news. In the desert, someone is shouting, get the road ready for Yahweh. Make the road straight in the desert. Our God is coming. Fill in the valleys. Level out every mountain and hill. Smooth out the rough and rugged ground. Then Yahweh's greatest feet will be visible. In other words, get yourself ready to focus on not what you do for God, the religious stuff you do for God, but on what God did religiously as your substitute. Everyone, everywhere will see it at the same time. Yahweh has given his word. This will happen. Someone told me to shout. I asked, what should I holler out? Yell. We humans are like grass. All our beauty fades as quickly as flowers dry up. Grass dries up and flowers wilt at Yahweh's command. And so do people, right? The older we get, the more wizened we look. On guys, hair falls out, complexions wrinkle, bodies slump and stoop. We wither just like grass in Minnesota in December. It's not green and sprightly. We humans are like grass. Verse 7, grass dries up and flowers wilt at Yahweh's command, and so do people. Grass dries up and flowers do wilt, but our God's message is going to last forever. People of Jerusalem, you have good news to tell. Get up on a high mountain. Shout as loud as you can, people in Jerusalem. You have good news to tell. Speak up loud and clear. Don't be timid. Tell the people in Judah's cities, here is your God. Here is your God. The powerful ruler, Yahweh, is coming. He's going to show he's the one in control. He's bringing along the rewards he's earned for people. The people he's rescued arrive ahead of him. Like a shepherd, he takes care of his flock. He gathers them like lambs in his arms. He carries them close to him, and he gently helps the sheep and their lambs. In other words, what this Bible section is saying is the message that God had Isaiah tell is a message that he means for everyone to hear about how Jesus earned the spandex Jesus costume and gave it to all people. What gets you in trouble is when you don't believe it's relevant to you. God doesn't want that to happen. He wants you to personalize it, to believe that your life depends on what Jesus did in your place, and he for sure did it. That's Isaiah 40. It's a big deal in the Bible, Isaiah 40, these verses we just looked at.
but we can't linger here. We have to go to the New Testament for our New Testament section for today in the letters at the end of the Bible. So 2 Peter chapter 3 is really important because it's talking about how each of us is going to see Jesus. We can't say going to see Jesus again. We never met him before. We're going to meet him for the first time, but we kind of did meet him in the past because we saw the stuff he told us about in the Bible. He told us in Isaiah 40, he's coming, that he's here. And, and what he did for us, he paid for all our wrongs. But in 2 Peter 3, he's telling us, again, he's telling us stuff about himself. He's letting us meet Jesus. And he's telling us you're safe no matter what things look around you. Take a look at this section. It's a famous section from the Peter second letter. Dear friends, don't ignore this fact. To the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like one day. That does, let me just pause for a second. That does not mean that at the, in the first pages of the Bible, those days of creation were billions of year-long periods of time during which God jump-started it and let it develop at its own pace. No, 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 no. This, the days in the beginning of the Bible, God specifies are 24-hour days. There was evening and there was morning the first day. It's talking here about how no one can be sure of when to plan for Jesus' arrival, his second arrival. The day, the Lord, verse 9, isn't slow about keeping his promises, like the one about coming to introduce himself to each human being in history, as some people think he is. No, he's being patient. The reason he's here right now is because he's being patient with you people. He doesn't want to destroy anyone. He wants all people to have an opportunity to turn to him and change the way they think and act. The day of the Lord's return is going to surprise us like a thief. That day, the universe is going to disappear with the sound of an explosion. One big explosion to get rid of the whole universe. The heat is going to melt the whole universe. It will tear up the earth and everything it holds. It will destroy everything here. Everything here suffered contamination from humans and their sin propensity. So he's going to redo it, remodeling. This will be the end of all things, verse 11. So what kind of people should you be? You should serve and honor God with your life. You should look forward to the day God makes the final decision about each person and hurry it along. When that day comes, he'll set the universe on fire and burn it up. Everything that makes up the universe will blaze and melt. But we look forward to a new universe and a new earth, a place where everything is perfect. We got continents, seven of them or so, right? There won't be seven continents when Jesus comes back and gives us a new universe and a new earth. You, oceans aren't going to separate one group of people from another like it does now. Everybody will be together, the Bible explains, and everybody in God's new world, in paradise on earth, is going to be with Jesus. We look forward to what God's promised, a new universe and a new earth, a place where everything is perfect. So, dear friends, while you're waiting, make every effort to have him find you at peace, because you know the news about Jesus. Without spiritual stains, 
or blemishes. And that is the second of our Bible sections for today. Really good also because it puts perspective on things. It's telling us don't hold on too tight to what you got now, to what your life is like. Because it's not always going to be this way. And it's not going to be this way for the majority of your time. The thing that matters is what Jesus did in our place and what he's going to do at the end. And then that takes us to today's gospel section. We are done with Matthew. Last week, we started on the Mark gospel, and we're going to try to keep it in order in the Mark gospel. And so we're starting right at the very beginning. We're, we're going to go with the first eight verses of Mark's gospel. And he, he tells us that what I'm going to describe to you is incredibly great news, but it's only incredibly great because of this person I'm going to tell you about, who is Jesus, and at the same time, he's a 100% human person. He's a 100% God at the same time, and that's the reason he can make everything right about you and everything right about this world, this universe, again one day. So here we go, Mark's gospel. And this is the one we're going to spend more time with. This is the good news about Jesus, Messiah, who is God, the Son. It starts as God said it would in the prophet Isaiah's book. I'm going to send my messenger ahead of you. So the you is talking about Jesus. I'm going to send my messenger, who we know is John the Baptizer to get your highway ready for you. In the desert, someone is shouting. Hold on, I gotta get my other sheet of paper. Get the road ready for Yahweh, because he's coming. Make a straight path for him. John the baptizer was in the desert telling people about a baptism that changes hearts and lives. As people hear how God rid us of our sins. People all over Judea County, the southern county in the Holy Land, where Jerusalem, the capital city, and the Temple Square, this massive uh, place where there's you can stage 200,000 people. And the people in the city of Jerusalem went to see and hear John. As they admitted the evil they had done, he baptized them in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made from camel's hide. He wore a leather belt around his waist. His food was grasshoppers and wild honey. He announced someone more powerful is going to come. I'm not good enough to stoop down and untie his sandals. Now, people knew that John was getting messages for the first time in 400 years from the only real God. This John the baptizer guy was getting messages from God, and they were to tell people, he's here, the mystery man, the superman, the stand-in body double for every person in humanity is here. And he's God. That's why um, John says he's more powerful than anybody. And I'm not good enough to stoop down and untie his sandals. I baptize you people with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So, here is a picture from the bluffs above the dead lake. That's what you can see off in the distance. This is the Holy Land. And if you ever go to visit the Holy Land, you will see this massive expanse of water that's completely a disaster. It's near the area where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be. 
And this is the area where John the baptizer spent a good part of his life in this area. It's called a deserted area. People aren't going to hang around here because as you can see, there is no, not much vegetation, not much water, and not much protection from the sun, which really beats down on people here. When you travel from the country of Jordan that you can see at the top of the screen on the horizon, that's the country of Jordan over there. And when you come down from the country of Jordan and take a vehicle across this area to get into the country of Israel, after you pass customs, then you will see a sign on the side of the road that says, over here is where the cave is that John, Jonah, a Jewish guy, Jonah the baptizer lived here. And you will go, why in the world did he live here? Because God told him to. This is at least 10 miles from Jerusalem. Jerusalem's to the east. And, you, and it's a significant climb and elevation. This is about 1,000 feet below sea level down here in this deserted area. And Jerusalem is like 3,000 feet above sea level. So you can imagine the climb that this road to the right on the screen is going to take to get up to where civilization is. This is where John the baptizer lived. This is where God told him to live because it matched up with what Isaiah in the first Bible section today that we had. It says that the guy is going to be shouting about Yahweh being here. He's going to do it in the desert, though, a place you don't want to go, but a place you're going to go because you're going to want to see this mystery guy, Jonah, who goes around explaining the news from the Old Testament to people about how the only real God is living on earth. He's a Jewish guy. He's living in the Holy Land. Jonah the baptizer did not look like this. He would look the opposite of this. This guy's got a haircut and a, probably a pretty spendy haircut at that. This guy's got a fancy suit on. Jonah the baptizer does not wear fancy suits. He doesn't even have a closet. He doesn't even have a home to live in. He wears bare bones clothes, stuff he found in a rummage sale, camel's hide clothes. John the baptizer isn't the married guy. He doesn't have a beautiful wife standing next to him. And John the baptizer is not an attractive looking guy. He looks like a reject from Duck Dynasty. God told his parents who were senior citizens when he was born, because he was a miracle baby. God told his parents, who we know the names of, Elizabeth was his mom and Zechariah was his dad. God told them never to cut Jonah's hair, their son Jonah. Don't cut his hair ever. And when he gets, you know, through adolescence and he starts to get facial hair, don't let him cut that either. Tell him he's not allowed to do that. God said so. And tell him he's here to announce that Messiah is around. He's living on earth. He's a human being and he's God himself. Jonah the baptizer would look worse than these people from Survivor. The people from Survivor, from Survivor sometimes got to eat weird stuff you would never want to touch because it's the only kind of nutrition and hydration they can find. Jonah the baptizer takes any kind of water he can get from the sky to hydrate his body fluids, rehydrate them. John the baptizer eats bugs. It said that in here. In, in verse 6, his food was grasshoppers and wild honey. In other words, the only things he could find to eat is what he ate. And so a lot of times he didn't eat. 
for days. And it didn't bother him one bit because he was trying to focus himself on what the Old Testament Bible told him about his own unworthiness. Even though he was a miracle baby and even though God was regularly talking to him in his ear, like one of those Old Testament messages, he knew that didn't make him any, anywhere special. He knew he was full of sin. He said it here. I'm not good enough, verse 7, to stoop down and untie this special guy's sandals. You know what this is? This is that runner that they send down the aisle when there's going to be a wedding. And, you know, you're not normally allowed to walk on that because that's something that only the bride gets to walk on when she enters and the bride and the groom walk on it when they leave. Other people are going to feel weird walking on it because it's not for them. And that's what John was saying about Jesus. He's the man that the whole Old Testament Bible talked about. And nobody else deserves the credit that he does because he's not just going to be an ideal human. He's not going to look ideal, but he is going to be ideal on the inside. Like Adam, when God made Adam at the beginning, he's going to be ideal in, in that he never has a selfish thought or a mean glance or an unkind word. He never does anything wrong. One time he asked people who knew him, anybody here, can anybody recall any wrong thing I've ever done? He was trying to help them understand he's their substitute. He's there for a reason. He's the mystery guy that God had be the stand in for every single human. I don't know if you saw this, Somebody made a map, I believe the first map of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And along with being able to see a map of our galaxy, they had a little unsettling news. They said that the Earth is headed toward a black hole. The Earth is headed toward a black hole as if we didn't already have enough troubles and problems and wondering if we're going to make it. Christians look at things a little different. They know that the Milky Way galaxy and its purported black hole are not in charge of our lives. They don't decide when we live, how healthy we're going to be, who our parents are, how our circumstances in life go, we know that the God of the Bible's in charge of things. And we know that he's not going to let things end here until the reemergence of this God, the Son, that this Bible reading talks about. John the Baptizer tells us, I didn't realize that he was the one. He's talking about his relative, a guy named Joshua, or his Greek name was Jesus. What, what John told people is when God sent me to baptize, he told me, the one you see the Spirit come down and stay on is the one. That's the man. A human, 100%, and the creator and judge of all humans. He, John says, I saw it. I saw the Holy Spirit come down and stay on a guy. And it was my relative. He is God, the son. I know we're used to hearing Jesus talk about himself being the son of God. But the son of God sounds like maybe, you know, there was a long time when God was just around and then he had a son. No, when you say God the Son, you mean this guy was as long around as long as God the Father was, only he's the Son. There never was a time when he didn't exist. He is God himself and a human at the same time. This put a completely different spin on Jonah the baptizer's life. He knew this guy's in control of everything that happens, and this guy knows everything 
about me. You remember that Bible account where uh, a rich religious Jew named Simon, which is a popular Jewish name, it's named after Simeon, one of Jacob, one of the great great grandsons of, of Abraham, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. This Simeon guy invited Jesus over for dinner at his home. And when that happened in Bible times, this was an event in that neighborhood. Everybody in the neighborhood knew that they could come, but not to eat. No, the eating was just for the guest of honor, in this case, Jesus, and the hosts, and whoever he chose to sit at his table. Everybody else could come and crowd into the house and line the walls, and they could listen to a celebrity and what he had to say and what he focused on and how he acted, how he dressed, what he looked like. And this lady came to Simon's house. She was, had a reputation. And everybody was surprised when she showed up. And she headed for where Jesus' feet were sticking out on the cushion he was laying at, at the low table. The Bible says she got a spot there, right where Jesus' feet stuck out, and that she began to cry. She began to cry because she knew she was at the feet of God himself and that he was here not to lay down the law to her and make her pay, but he was here to take her place and serve her sentence and feel every second of the punishment she deserved. This is a famous painting and it is in the city, in the area of Alsace, which you know is kind of on the, France gets this area sometimes, sometimes German people get it. But a guy painted this painting for the altar and it's a picture of Jesus on the cross but over to the right there you got John the baptizer and you can see what he's talking about see at his feet is a lamb with a cup underneath and a cross over its shoulder remember John would always point to Jesus and say this is the lamb that God sent and he's taking the place and the punishment for every single human who's ever lived, including myself. And look, he's got the Bible open. And he's got a big finger sticking out. A longer finger than you're supposed to have. Because he's pointing everybody to Jesus and not to himself. You know, here's the picture in its setting in this smallish kind of church in Europe. And it's doing the job in a visual way that the Bible wants to do on us. It wants to point us at history's main figure, a human in the Middle East, in the Holy Land, who's the substitute for everybody's sins. And, and there's writing on this painting it's in Latin, because then you were uh, sure the people who could read would be able to read it. And it's a quote from John. And it says, that guy has to get bigger. And I have to get littler. Maybe you can see the very bottom line. It looks like an M-I-N-V-I, -I, like our word minimal. It's John going, I need to get littler because I'm nothing. And look at his clothes. It's the same sort of stuff we see in the Bible reading. And I bet you his Bible there is open to Isaiah chapter 40 that talked about him, but said it's about God himself coming to do the thing that nobody else can do 
to get themselves out of trouble. John says, I can't even get myself out of trouble by going without food and not having a wardrobe or a closet, never going shopping, never going out to eat. That doesn't get me anywhere with God because I got so many sins that I can never get myself out of trouble and I'm exactly like you. But he goes, there's another person and that's the person I want to point you to. He's the man that's going to fix it all it's about Jesus. He needs the publicity. And so that's what John did. Now, on this famous painting, off to the sides there, you can see there's one guy off to the left and there's another guy off to the right. They are not important. The one who is important is the one that looks the least powerful. But he's God himself and he's dead because he's a human being and he can die and he does die of taking the punishment that you and I deserve forever and ever and ever for every one of our sins. Jesus took the punishment so that we get complete closure from God. He doesn't have anything to indict us for and he dresses us up in the spandex Jesus costume, the proof that we are without sin and holy and pleasing to him. Look at, look at the picture of Jesus. He's got like odd looking bumps on his body. And if you're seeing what I'm seeing, he's got thorns sticking out of his skin. Because remember in the Bible, after Adam and Eve sinned, remember it said that thorns and thistles are going to be a consequence of your sin, and they're going to be an invasion of your life. They're going to make life miserable for you. All because of sin, God wants us to remember things aren't right if you don't have Jesus. And so Jesus has taken the thorns and thistles of life, and this city where they uh, present the picture used to be a place where people could go who had all kinds of incurable diseases to get hospital care. And it wanted to paint Jesus as one of those people who's just as messed up as we are because he's taken on our identity and put the final stroke in the sentence that we were supposed to face. This is really a good piece of artwork that illustrates the critical relevance of Jesus in your every second of your life and every second of mine. People told that John never did one miracle. John the baptizer, Jonah the baptizer, but everything he said about this Jesus is true because John said he's the one who takes the place of every human in history. And that means he takes the place of you and me. The Bible also says in another spot that Jesus had more students and baptized more people than John. Jesus is bigger, just like John said. Jesus needs to get bigger. He needs more publicity. I need less. Jesus was trying to help people understand how God was going to earn people peace of mind, and he was going to do it himself. That woman who got near Jesus' feet, she wasn't trying to endear herself to Jesus by being sad about her sins and crying about the stupid things she had done that got her such a bad reputation in her community. But she cried, and she wasn't realizing it, but her tears were falling on Jesus' feet. And the Bible says that when she saw the mess she made on Jesus' feet that had come in from outdoors where there was goat urine and manure all over the place and would splash onto Jesus' feet through his sandals. Then when she saw the mess she was making, she cleaned up that mess on Jesus' feet with her hair. Not because she knew that then God would say, okay, okay, stop already. That's enough. You've fixed everything between God and you by doing this. No, she was doing this because she was grateful for the excess of love God would show and the total clemency that Jesus would earn. And then she kissed his feet. She kissed them, the Bible says, over and over. She was so grateful that there was hope 
for her, even though she did never could never deserve it. This is the case for you and me too. John says, I would never get near Jesus' feet because I'm a bigger low life than that woman. And God wants you and me to see that for ourselves too. But that God loves us anyways and gave us the ultimate Christmas gift. He gave us himself in a human body and he gave us safety and security beyond anything we can imagine. So telling God's greatest feat is not something you have to do. You don't have to do it. You can still benefit from what Jesus did. But when we know about it, God helps us be excited about it. It's a natural response to coming into contact with God's rescuer for sinners. And that is us. So, John the baptizer is not the prettiest boy in the neighborhood, and neither is Jesus. But they mean a lot to us because we know what Jesus did, and we know why John did the publicizing. Because he know his life depends on Jesus and what Jesus did for him and us. And this is the reason we take a whole month of Sundays here to, to get our heads right and ready so that Christmas means something more than what we can get. It's what God can give. Let's close with a prayer. Father, we're really grateful for the gift that you gave. A gift that didn't come wrapped up in paper with a bow on it but that came wrapped up in skin and had tissue and blood. Our substitute, who is our judge. Wow. How can we ever thank you? We know that you give us some ideas. We can do like John and point to Jesus when we get opportunities and help people see what he did and that there is hope for them and us because of what he did in our place. Thanks for blessing us with this news today from the Bible. Help it make an impression on us. Help us keep studying so that we keep fueling a desire to live for you and be a benefit to people around us. In Jesus' name we ask this, amen. And so now receive and believe the blessing of the Lord himself that God custom made for you personally with Jesus and his life on earth as your substitute in his damnation, death on the cross for you. The Lord's blessing you all the time and he's constantly protecting you. The Lord's making his face smile on you, even though there should be less than a smile. And he's being gracious to you, the opposite of what we all deserve. The Lord's looking on you, paying attention to you, loving you, and he's giving you his peace. And so that is our time together today. I 